Uh, our next speaker is Joel Stanley. Joel's a Linux hacker and embedded electronics enthusiast. By day, he works on free and open source firmware for IBM's power servers. And by night, he hacks on FPGAs, microcontrollers, weather balloons, and anything he can find a UART on. Um, so he'll be talking on MicroPython energy monitoring. Thank Joel. you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so today, we're going to have a bit of a chat about the use of electrical energy in homes in Australia. And it's a bit of an intersection of my interests as a homeowner, a bill payer, a hobbyist electronics nerd, and an embedded software engineer. Uh, so we're going to chat a bit about the power grid in Australia, um, energy costs, and do-it-yourself energy monitoring, um, including some of the challenges in, in using the hardware that's out there to do that. Oh, wicked. My laptop's just gone to sleep. Uh, that's a good start. All right. So I enjoy talking about my hobbies at conferences. Um, I've spoken about launching weather balloons about management controllers, the summer of code projects I worked on uh, to develop the firmware that's recording this conference right now. Um, I've also given talks on the random hacks I've done, um, making my Nintendo play iView, porting Chrome to ARM back in the day, and uh, more recently playing around the insides of my brand new car. Uh, so my other passion, aside from giving talks, is, uh, is, is kind of sharing my skills with other, others and my insights. And um, so I was expo I first exposed to, to MicroPython at Python AU 2016 last year. Um, and I was just blown away by Damon, Damien's technical ability and his enthusiasm. Uh, I got really excited about microcontrollers um, and using them in a, in a way I hadn't been excited since someone first showed me Arduino way back in the day. Um, and so that kind of led from one thing to another to uh, teaching MicroPython to 15-year-olds at the National Computer Science School, and so where we used the micro bit with MicroPython on it. And this is a picture of the web-based microbit emulator that Jim, who's in the audience here, uh, demoed at PyCon AU last year. And uh, Jim and Nikki actually just gave a talk about some of this work uh, over in the education stream uh, about an hour ago. Uh, so this is Jim with microcontrollers strapped to him. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens if you go and teach at the National Computer Science Summer School uh, and challenge the students to, to make you suffer. Uh, they, they wire you up and make you do exercise. So energy use in Australia. Um, We've got this grid that stretches from up in Queensland, down the east coast of Australia, over to South Australia. And along the way, there's a bunch of different generation equipment spread out along the breadth of the network. And uh, the consumers are kind of similarly dispersed um, in kind of clumps around the place. And so last year, we used about 900 petajoules of energy, 250 terawatt hours, uh, depending on your sources. And uh, all this energy is bought and sold on the national electricity market. And so that's the market that determines the prices for our electrical energy that we use in our homes and, and in our industries. Um, so one of the great South Australia, I'm from South Australia, we recently got power. Oh, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> electricity has been in public use since, since 1855 in Adelaide, so it's, it's not actually that bad. Um, but our state's been in the news a bit recently uh, on the topic of electricity. Um, there's a, a fair chunk of our electricity is generated by renewable sources. Uh, and it keeps on growing. And um, we, we've moved away from generating any coal locally in that state to lots of wind farms and, and a bit of rooftop, rooftop solar. Um, so as you can see, this is from this morning. Um, SA was generating about half its energy from gas and the other half from wind farms, um, with a little bit of uh, small solar, so rooftop solar um, on the end there in the yellow. And so as you can see, there's no coal generation in that mix at the moment. Um, also to note is not all of SA's energy is sourced from within the state. Lots of it comes from the interconnect with the eastern states. Um, but yeah, so why is there no coal? Um, there was a coal station at Port Augusta in the middle of the state there, um, but they blew it up. Um, I like this video. I don't know, it goes for a few seconds. So this is, this is uh, up in Port Augusta about a year ago. They, they started knocking it down. So there's the big smokestack. Uh, Gone crunch. Bye-bye. Um, and so most of that's been disassembled now. Um, and the, the coal mine that was up at Tennant Creek has been kind of closed and the township around that closed. And it's all kind of uh, finished now. So um, onwards and upwards. So replacing it literally like about five kilometres next to that power, power station is, um, is this facility run by Sundrop Farms. And it's a concentrated solar farm. Uh, so they collect a bunch of solar using mirrors up on that, that shiny collector in the middle there and use the energy to heat greenhouses and desalinate water to grow tomatoes, uh, essentially in the desert, um, which is kind of cool. And when you're driving along the highway, uh, it's this kind of shining beacon kind of uh, to your right, and you have to be careful not to swerve off the road as you kind of admire it. Um, but it is it's a pretty, 
pretty cool piece of tech that's kind of popped up there, and, and they're thinking about building more of them. Um, so another newsworthy, newsworthy event in South Australia was the September 2016 storm that came across the state, and it knocked down the power lines uh, up in the north of the state, and through a series of other failures, the interconnect and all the generators were isolated from the grid, so no power. Um, you can see there the SA is using 22 megawatts. Normally, it'd be using about 2,000 megawatts, so energy went essentially to zero. Um, we're all at work. It happened about three o'clock. Uh, within half an hour, the mobile phone network was so congested, it didn't work. All the streets were congested because there's no um, traffic lights anymore, and um, and it took a long time to come back. Uh, so, so this is why you know that doesn't work anymore. In case you don't know how uh, electricity towers work, um, so the, the state was out without power for that evening. Um, Adelaide came back on the next day, but some of the the more regional areas, Port Lincoln, where I grew up, um, took about 42 hours before they had power again. Um, so no phones, supermarkets were empty. The army came in and distributed rations from the sports oval because you know things were looking pretty dire there for a while. We didn't know when they get the power back on. So this is a, a bit of a timeline of, of as they kind of uh, connected all the, the parts of the grid back up and, and whatnot, um, which is very interesting, but not what we're here to talk about today. Um, so other bit of interesting news that happened the other week was um, this bloke came to town and, and spoke about his batteries, uh, which is, is kind of exciting. So Tesla, along with NewGen, are um, building a well, they've already built a big wind farm and they're going to connect a, a big ass battery to it and um, see what they can do to stabilize the grid using that, which is it's pretty interesting to see how that'll go. Um, so the, the grid's been evolving in, in, in the country um, and as old technology has been replaced with new, there's been trade-offs and, and new problems to be solved. And one of the, the big problems kind of at the forefront of people's minds is, is um, the impact of price rises on, on, um, on the household kind of budget. And so you can see SA is at the top there with um, the, the most expensive prices in, in the state, in the country. And so this kind of makes you think about what can I do? Um, you know, can I, can I reduce my bill? Um, should I use sol solar or storage? Or, or can I make my household more efficient? Um, and, and when you start thinking that through, it's like, well, what's my consumption? How much am I using? And so currently everyone gets um, their consumption data quarterly from the, the, in the form of power bills. That's my power bill there. Um, but how do you can control for, you know, the seasons changing and changing equipment? You know, for instance, I put a new fridge in in December. Uh, is that why my power use has gone down? Or is it because I was in holiday in Sydney um, for most of summer? You know, uh, we, we don't know that. Um, and so it's hard to see the impact of small changes as the average averaged across the four months. Um, so I'm, I'm privileged to live in a, a new home with good insulation. It's got LED lighting and, and modern appliances. And you can see our usage is going down. But like I said, perhaps that's the fridge. How do we know? Um, and, and so the, the other thing to think about that we don't get from our power bills is when are we consuming? You know, is, are we using our energy in the evening when it's dark so solar's not going to help us? Uh, are we using it uniform across the day? Um, and, and things like this. And then there's other concerns. You know, my brother recently had a, a child, um, so his energy bills went through the roof. Um, and so he's thinking, about what can I do? But is he using, again, is he using all the energy during the day? Um, while you know the kids at home, or is it that they're running the washing machine late at night? Uh, you, you just can't tell from from your power bill. Um, and and so you know you want to know where should you make your investment. Uh, another one is my, my parents have solar on their shed, but they've got this tiny little copper bit of copper that takes it down to the grid, and uh, they can't feed back in very well. And you know is that because the the thin copper, or is it because the grid voltage happens to be really high, uh, you know, regional town that that wasn't really sized for. Um, for lots of homes having solar feeding back into the grid. So these questions are pretty hard to answer without a bit of data. Um, and so in addition to, to knowing kind of the answer to these questions, um, just knowing how much we're using can influence our behaviours as well. So, you know, we can, we can save a bit of energy by changing the way we're using energy. Uh, so Internet of Things, yeah, it's going to fix all our problems. Um, this photo is from my, one of my favourite Twitter accounts, Internet of Shit. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it shows a, a stack trace from a little embedded Linux device on a tap, um, <laughs> as you do. Uh, so, Internet of Things, there's there's lots of challenges there. You know, uh, there's the security issue. You know, um, we don't want our, our LED lights to turn to botnets. Um, there's there's cost. Um, you know, to be competitive, you need to drive bright costs down, but you also want to you know make sure you've got something useful that someone wants. And connectivity is another another big challenge. Um, there's an interesting Adelaide startup that's planning on launching micro satellites to do. 
IoT connectivity. Um, we've got a cellular network. There's you know Wi-Fi, different kinds of radios, all these kind of things. How do you you know integrate this and, and make it useful? So there's money to be made, um, and sensors are fun. I really like recording data. Um, so this is this is my my lounge room temperature for the past year. Um, this was a, a little MicroPython project I set myself a year ago to uh, record the the temperature using an, an ESP8266. Um, I didn't really have any plans for it, just kind of set it up and left it there, and it's still sitting there behind the bookshelf recording data. So you can see summer comes, then winter comes, it gets cooler. You can see in the bottom right there, that's a, a normal weekday where you know we're at work and the house heats up a little bit because the sun's there, and then we come home and turn the AC on for half an hour, and then it turns off and it kind of stays a bit warmer. So that, that, that's kind of fun. Um, there's other types of data that we can look at. Uh, this is a Python project by my friend called FPOS, and uh, it looks at your household expenditure, so, you know, where your money's going, where you're spending it on bills, where you're spending it on beer, on electronics, on your computers. Um, uh, and again, you know, this looks to try and influence behavior to work out, you know, uh, can I kind of change my spending habits to save a bit of money? Um, smoke ping. Again, more data that I like collecting in my home. So this sits there and sends out a packet every 30 seconds to measure the round trip time to, I think this is Telstra.com from my home um, wireless ISP. So um, maybe someone cut down a tree in like late October last year or something. Um, maybe there were some cranes at a construction site in April uh, that made the, the ping time go up. But yeah, so you know, interesting data. And from this, we can gain kind of interesting insights. Um, so we've got all this data. How do I get the same for my household energy monitoring? This is my um, meter in the box outside my house with a serial number wiped out. I just saw that before I came on to talk. Um, so, so this is the thing that the power network uses to give me my quarterly data. Um, it has a nice little LED that blinks, uh, I think, every kilowatt that gets consumed. Um, that's, it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to get into and it's not really generic. Um, so, so what else can we do? Because uh, this isn't a member of the Internet of Things um, and it's also covered in these scary looking tamper proof um, devices that, that make me kind of not want to touch it. So, so what can I do to, uh, to measure my household energy usage? Um, this is a photo I stole from Tisham. Uh, Tisham's in the crowd here. Um, his name's going to come up a couple of times. But um, so, so this is, this is uh, his energy monitoring setup, that, which I've replicated in my home. Uh, so we've got a, an ESP8266 ESP um, connected to the ADC there uh, in the top of the picture. I've just dropped off the Wi-Fi. I wonder if that's going to screw up my talk. Um, and uh, so what that's doing, it's got a current clamp. So the big blue thing there is, is wrapped around one of the windings of the, the 240 volt cable that's going into the dummy load, the, the light there. And so that's going to measure the current of the system. Um, it's also got a, a transformer there, and that's measuring a, a step down version of the voltage. Um, and so uh, we know that the power is voltage times current. So with those two numbers, we can get the power usage uh, and the reason we want to measure voltage as well as current is that even though our grid is nominally 230 volts, um, it can go up by about 10% and down by 6 and still be within spec. And um, if you look at the data, it does drift a fair bit across the day. So while you could kind of ignore that and assume nominally 240, uh, 230 volts, if you want to get a nice accurate reading, you want to measure voltage as well as current. Um, so that feeds into the little node NCU, which then can post it to your, your, the, the service of your choice. It can do... Um, MQTT, it can, it can do a HTTP post, um, you, know, you can make an SSH connection to some box somewhere. Um, in this case, Tish was, was uploading it to ThingSpeak, which is a proprietary um, data collection platform for doing Internet of Things. Uh, so you can see here we've got the, the current and the voltage on the, the two diagonals and um, the total power usage in the bottom left there. Um, and so you start recording this over time, you can start seeing patterns in, in your usage. and. Um, and working out, you know, what time of the day you're using power and, and what appliances you're using, what appliances are, are particularly energy hungry and, and which ones you don't need to worry about, things like this. So while we're on the topic of Tish, this is his crowd, crowd supply campaign. So crowd supply is a, um, a kind of an open, a very open hardware friendly uh, crowdfunding camp, uh, service. Um, the boards that are using, being used to record this conference, they were financed through through a similar program. Uh, and Tish launched a crowdsourcing campaign on Monday to uh, sell some of these kits. Um, so he's got various, you know, little little boards and whatever that that could be put together to to be used for energy monitoring. Um, so some of the hardware is simple as like a generic ADC board, 
but it goes all the way through to um, these commercial power monitoring ICs, similar kind of things that are in the SA Power Networks box I showed you earlier. Uh, and they provide a bunch of extra features on top of just measuring some kind of voltage like an ADC does, an analog to digital converter. So um, the downside of getting started with these devices, as Tish explained to me, was uh, they, you have to buy some dev kit for hundreds of bucks, uh, and that's no good for a hobbyist like me. Um, I'm looking to save money, not spend more. And so, so Tish has put some of these on, on little dev boards that plug into you know, like a, a feather wing cell form factor or, or some other kind of simple header that you can use for prototyping. So opening up energy monitoring to more enthusiasts, which is, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, so these are, these are some screenshots I stole from the Crowd Supply page. Um, so you can see some of the kits and then, then a kind of an installed setup that um, Tish has got there with the, the, the big black box is the, um, the voltage transformer. So it's stepping down your 230 volts down to something that can be uh, sampled by a microcontroller safely. And then outside the big scary you know, box that you get the electrician to touch, you've got your nice little hobbyist bit that's playing with lower voltages. And so that's measuring the, the current and the voltage there. Um, and so Tish is, is a great lecture engineer and is a good software engineer, but he doesn't use MicroPython. So I thought, hey, I can help him out here. Um, I like porting MicroPython to random little things. Let's, let's see what we can do here. So in comes the MicroPython. Um, uh, Damien showed us how easy it is to get a sensor demo up and running if you're here for his talk this morning. Um, and I agree, you know, my temperature monitor took me an hour or so and it's been running for a year. That's the, the, the lounge room temperature sensor I showed you before. Uh, and so I got hold of an Adafruit Hazar. So this is this um, kind of dual inline form factor uh, dev board with, a, with an ESP module on it. Uh, and that runs this uh, circuit Python fork of, of MicroPython uh, that's developed by Adafruit. Um, and so it's got a little nice little LCD display on there. And the, the Python module uh, was, was you know, ported to CircuitPython, excuse me, and, and looked like it would be good to go, but I tried to get it going and, and no dice. Um, so I'd, I'd hit a compatibility issue where the module was written for an older version of their MicroPython framework. And to save RAM, they'd ripped out that functionality from the, the, the C code, from the binary that you, the MicroPython binary you have. And so I was, I was stuck. Um, and a couple of frustrating evenings of hacking, uh, I, I re-implemented it in a, well, stubbed it out in a bit of Python, so I could still use that module. Um, the module supported things like, you know, color displays and frame buffer flipping and all this kind of gear that for a, a 32 by 64 character display we definitely didn't need. Uh, and I managed to get it going again. Um, and, and this is kind of one of the, the challenges we have in MicroPython land, is, is deciding what to include in the image in a, in a flash and RAM constrained environment. Um, so, so these guys had made a decision to chop this bit out, but it did mean that useful functionality that, that should have been kind of plug and play and off we go, didn't work. Um, and for hobbyists, that, that, that's not a great thing. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of the momentum out of, out of your hacking after hours and, and uh, slows you down a lot. Um, I did send a pull request and they fixed it up and uh, Anna gave a talk earlier today where she used a very similar module and it was plug and play for her. So it's good to see that's been resolved. I was just obviously there in this nice transition period between the, the, uh, the new and the old. Uh, so that, that was one of my, my kind of challenges with this board. Uh, so I decided to switch boards to, to see what, what else was going on. Um, again, Tish is the source of all my little toys. Um, he lent me this LoPi board. So it's a ESP32 coupled with a, a LoRa radio. So this is the proprietary 900 megahertz um, spread spectrum little radio module. Um, very popular in Internet of Things circles. Uh, we happened to use it for my weather balloon project to do the downlink. So we had one of these floating 30, 40Ks in the air, um, downlinking data to, a, to an antenna on the back of a car. Um, and so they use MicroPython, which, which makes them cool. Um, they, they unfortunately, a bit like Adafruit, had gone and forked MicroPython, though. So they had their own version of the documentation. Um, the documentation kind of mentioned SPI. Um, the SP32 has four SPI, hardware SPI ports. It kind of mentioned them, but then somewhere else it kind of alluded to the fact that the LoRa chip is connected via SPI, and so you couldn't use the SPI ports. Uh, and the documentation linked to the MicroPython generic documentation, which obviously didn't work on this board. Um, they've since updated the documentation. Now it just links back to the own page, the same page you're already on, so it doesn't actually take you anywhere. Uh, I'm not sure if that's an improvement. At least you're not going to waste your time implementing something that doesn't work. But uh, this, is, this is another one of the challenges that I've, I've kind of had to face in, in going through this project where 
Um, when you're using these, these you know, a micro Python and a micro Python board for something that someone else has done, the way they've worked all the hard bits, it's, it's so much fun to use. It just works out of the box. But when you're trying to do something that's not quite the same, um, another example is I was trying to use uh, this module with a board that was designed for an ESP8266, and the 8266 didn't have as many hardware UARTs. So the common way to use serial with that was software serial. Um, the ESP32 has lots of hardware serials, so they're like, oh no, we don't have a software serial module for the ESP32. But that's no good if the, um, the dev board, the, the, sorry, the, uh, the feather wing board that I'm using doesn't have the right pins connected um, to the hardware UARTs. And so again, I, I was back at square one and able to kind of proceed. Uh, and so uh, as, as a professional kind of embedded software person, these are the kind of challenges we deal with all the time. Uh, but as a hobbyist, you, um, you kind of expect a little bit of a, a smoother ramp, I guess, sometimes. Uh, it's not like using the SPI port was that stranger thing to be doing for a little bit of embedded hardware. So it's definitely something where the, the MicroPython ecosystem uh, needs to evolve, I think. Um, so uh, I kind of did get it working. Uh, this is my test setup. Um, my electrician friends had a fit when they saw this. Uh, <laughs> attached to that orange cable there is a current clamp. So I, I broke out one of the windings from the 240 volts myself and attached the current clamp. Um, and then used it on the toaster. So the toaster's you know, nicely isolated away from anything else on my living room floor, um, but perhaps not as well isolated as it could be. Uh, <laughs> um, didn't set off the smoke alarms, didn't wake my partner, so that was all good. Um, and so, so that's kind of where I'm at with the project at the moment. Unfortunately, I don't have a nice happy conclusion where I can say I'm now using MicroPython energy monitoring in my home. Uh, maybe that's a, a lightning talk for next PyCon. Um, but, but that's kind of where we ended up. Uh, so that was all the prepared material I had. Um, there's some links if you want to go check out Tish's stuff, uh, which I encourage you to do. Uh, I'll go hassle him um, at the end of the talk. Uh, there's my Twitter account if you want to um, point out where I was wrong or what I did wrong with uh, using the ESP modules. Um, I'd be happy to, to be shown the light. Um, but yeah, I'd like to open up some questions and it's kind of trading of war stories if anyone else wants to chat about that. That's uh, all, it's a really interesting field for me. I've been looking at the, um, Emon uh, system. The one that I I have had trouble tracking down though is um, what I really like is sort of per circuit monitoring in the home, and I'd heard that there were devices out there like that replaced the circuit breaker with a module which could then get information out of it. Have you seen any like thing like that? And what what do they call and what do I Google? Um, I haven't seen anything that replaces the circuit breaker. I'm trying to find a specific slide and I can't see it. Um, one of the modules Tish has built is a, a DIN rail um, system. So that's the, the the physical mounts you have in your power meter box. Right. Um, so that that is no good for uh, it. Doesn't replace the circuit breaker, but you could use that kind of form factor thing to have a, a, a series of these. Oh, for each circuit in your home. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't gone down that route. I mean, it, it would be, that would be the ultimate to have every single device. Another way to do it, though, is um, Tish wants to respond, I think. He's, come, come up the front, Tish. Um, he's got one here to, to demo. Um, so another way to do that is to use, use maths. Um, so there's machine learning techniques that can pick out individual. So this is what I'm trying to find a picture of, but Tish just handed me one in the flesh instead. So, so this kind of looks like a, a fuse thing you've got in a fuse meter box. Um, it's got a nice little OLED display on there to, to give you a, a real-time readout, and it's, it's got the same guts as, as I was showing you photos of earlier. This is one of the things you can buy in his, his crowdsourcing campaign. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, one of the other techniques is instead of monitoring each individual circuit, you use a bit of machine learning to extract out the information you've got there and, and um, teach the system. What, which appliances are which. Uh, and obviously, the more data you collect, the, the more accurate the model can be. And so at that point, maybe you can tell what's on individual circuits, even though you don't have monitoring on every individual port. Yeah, I've heard of um, systems where there's, sorry. I think there was a, a company in Perth that did um, that was starting up that would 
basically you just attach a device to uh, like a current clamp and it samples at something like 500 kilohertz. And it, with that, it can actually recognise the signature of various DC converters, various motors starting up, AC induction motors, all that sort of stuff, and can actually then pick out the signature of those devices. But uh, that's still, as far as I can see, see uh, um, Kickstarter wear and uh, hasn't actually made it to production in shop kind of stuff yet. But, uh, yeah. This is a great pub conversation one. I'm not going to say anything up here. <laughs> um, yeah, hi. So we, yeah. Um, I, I did a little bit of research on a similar thing and I found that in, in Victoria um, there is one type of power meter that um, has a Zigbee interface. Okay. And uh, there I'm are sorry. controllers you can get that uh, will communicate with it, but apparently if you go to the um, power company, you can get the you can get Zigbee enabled on your on your um, meter. Okay. And I believe that there are Zigbee modules that you can get. Potentially, there could be a possibility to extract information from the meter if. Yeah, if I mean, got, and as a, a as someone who, who just who's bought a brand new home, I, yeah. I wish there was the option of picking which meter I had because there are meters that are a lot easier to get the data out than than reading the the pulse. Um, mm. Didn't have that choice, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I was in, be cool. sort of interested in the same concept, but um, haven't really pursued it. But it's just something. It, it is a bit unfortunate that all the hardware is sitting in the box there, uh, and and the data is 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 not made available. I mean, the, mm. the power company can't really get the data either. All that they're reading out is is the quarterly usage, um, even though in theory it could be sitting there logging and and um, and I, I mean this is something that might go forward. I, I literally read an article as I was walking into the talk today on ABC News about. Um, uh, voluntary load shedding for this summer. So if you, you go to an agreement to say, I'll turn off my air conditioner and my pool pump when when it's a hot summer's day. Um, and that's all well and good to have people promise, but if you can record people's actual usage um, and, and they're not using power, you can reward them in that way. So that, that would be interesting to see. And that, that is a, um, it's a positive Internet of Things application. You know, it's not a, an internet enabled um, dish, uh, what do you call it, tap, um, or something like that. So yeah, that'd be cool to see. It's a great, great talk. Interesting, uh, interesting topic. Um, I, I've been, I've just spent a lot of money to solar power my house with a Tesla power wall. But the in, in, individual devices is a challenge, and I see you using a clamp. So generally. What I've seen is clamps are inaccurate, um, mostly. Are there any other devices, or how do you get around um, the perception that clamps are not necessarily going to be giving you accurate data on what the devices are doing? I can't really speak to the accuracy of clamps. Um, Tish, do you want to grab the mic? Um, so uh, clamps can be up to 0.5% accurate. So for higher accuracy, typically you get these uh, shunts, current shunts. And the difficulty with current shunts, it, it makes the meter physically big. So the current shunt has to pass 80 amps or however many amps you are pulling. So the clamp there is rated at 100 amps. So it just makes the metering hardware big. And with the clamps, you are moving the lumpiness away to somewhere. You can get 0.5% clamps. This clamp I have is a 5% clamp. It's meant for not metering, but uh, advisory purposes. So you can just get more accurate, more expensive clamps to get better, better quality metering. Sorry? No, you can use shunts, as I said. You can use like a small resistor, which has very low resistance, and you can measure the voltage drop across it. The chip is capable of that. The ATM90 is capable of using shunts as the source for measuring how much current you're using and shunts are 0.01 percent accurate cool thanks guys uh, there was a question just here thanks for the nice talk i i work in energy monitoring and it's really nice to see some open hardware coming out so i was wondering with the end like your end idea is to monitor your household consumption are you actually able to install it in the meter box yourself or would you need to get an electrician out so yeah, the answer is no, um, and that's. I'll go back to the slide of of Tisha's setup, um, where the 
Oops, which one was it? All right, so you can see there all the, the, the 240 volt stuff or 230 volt stuff is inside the box. That's what you get the electrician to do. And the bit out to the right is, is low voltage, and so that's what you as a hobbyist, uh, you know, an unlicensed um, person can do. And so you it's also a one-phase device, so if you want to monitor multiple channels or multiple phases, you would need to get uh, more uh, devices. devices. Okay. For the whole product? No, for the chip. Okay, for the chip. Yeah, so just, just, just for the, the video, um, Tish just told us that you can get uh, devices that do multiple phases as well as the single phase one, so it just costs a little bit more. Great, thank you. Thanks. All right, All right. thanks again, Joel, for a fascinating talk um, and for our appreciation. I'm Here's a your mug. mug. Thank you.